uh, just to kind of recap in, in about 120 seconds, we learned from Scripture that Jesus said, I will build my house. So Jesus builds the church, but then he commissions us to build people. We partner with him in helping build each other up. That's our privilege and our responsibility. We're called to be our brother's keeper, our sister, uh, sister's keeper. We're here to challenge one another and to encourage one another. So we, we studied that, and then we, we, we began to look at maybe five primary areas in people's lives that need to grow, that need to be developed. And I preached a couple weeks ago about cars being overhauled, and uh, uh, someone said, Pimp My Ride, that's a great show. And um, the idea of looking at a, uh, the potential in a car that doesn't look so good and say, you know what, we can do something with this car. And uh, by, by submitting and surrendering to the Lord, God comes and he begins to do a work in our lives, right? And uh, we talk about cars having different systems. Well, people, we have different systems. And there's different areas in our lives that need to be developed. Pastor David has a thriving uh, uh, student ministry here at our church with, with Aaron, and, and we have high schoolers, we have middle school students, junior hires, and uh, it's amazing how in, in the middle schoolers, for instance, you might have DeMarco, who's like six foot like forever. He's huge, he's tall, and, and then, then you got his little buddies, his friends are his same age that might be like five foot two or whatever, and they're, they're the same age, but he has physically just like blossomed. He's a giant already, and, uh, and we see how in life, uh, physically, you can grow and you can develop. But you can, you can also develop emotionally, you can develop spiritually, uh, you can develop intellectually. We all have to grow up, right? I've actually met with some, some parents and some adults that are later in their years, and they're fully grown physically and possibly even emotionally, but spiritually and intellectually. It's like, man, you're missing a little something. We've got to help you. When it comes to the things of the Spirit, we've got to grow up as well. And uh, I, I, I preached on the topic of, of growing and looking at these different areas and looking at Ephesians chapter 6 where it talks about putting on the full armor of God. And it's interesting to me as I study that the armor covers different parts of our body. And uh, I launched the first Sunday talking about the, 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 the belt of truth, speaking of identity. I think if there's an area that we all need to grow in is an understanding of who we are in Christ. We are sons and daughters of God. We are children of God. Our identity, we're no longer slaves, but we are children of God. We are valuable to God. Your net worth is Jesus Christ himself. How much are you valued in God's eyes? He gave his only begotten son, the first and the best. He gave him because he loved you that much. And we got to understand our place in Christ. We are valuable to God. So identity, I think that's an area that so many of us struggle with. Who am I really? What is my purpose? What is my calling in life? How does God see me? We talked about removing these labels and, 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 and being comfortable with the person, the individual that God's called us to be. Last week, Pastor Elena preached, and she talked about the helmet of salvation, which connects with people's minds, your mind. The Bible says don't be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The Bible says in Proverbs, even as a man thinks, so he is. So how you think your mind, it needs to be submitted to, to, to the Lord himself, to the presence of God. And putting on this helmet that, that gives us a different mindset. We don't think like the world. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he says, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a, ch a child. I reasoned like a child. But then I grew up and I set apart, I set aside those childish, childish things. So we got to grow up and even in our mindset, in our mind, the way that we, we think and process, we need to be submitted to the ways of God. The Bible says in Isaiah that God's ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So our minds need to grow up. They need to be developed. Amen, somebody? This is more than intellect, but it's having the mind of Christ. And today we're going to continue in another area, and I'm going to talk about the shield of faith today. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to go to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. When you get there, you can say, uh-huh. Someone just lied. You weren't in Mark chapter 4 yet, but Mark chapter 4, when you, when you found it in your, on your phone or your Bible, when you, when you have it in front of you, just say, uh-huh. That's the way. I like it. All right, we're getting close. All right. <laughs> Bear with me here. We do have a saying, by the way, that a quiet church is a, so I give you permission to holler at your boy. Give me some hallelujahs if you want. And I like the passion and enthusiasm in the house of the Lord today. We're talking about anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. Jesus is saved. And today we're calling out upon the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen, somebody. So holler at your boy when you when you uh, feel a little uh-huh on the inside of you. Mark chapter 4, we're going to dive in together. If there's a title or a subtitle for this message today, that would be developing your faith muscle. Developing your faith muscle. Mark chapter 4, verse 35, it says, as evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and they started out. 
leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm that came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. By the way, side note, in my Bible, it says in this passage in in the Gospel of Mark, it's also told in Matthew and in Luke, this story right here of a storm out in this this, this ocean, the sea. And um, in this particular Gospel uh, recording, it says that other boats followed. Now, this is the only boat that had Jesus inside. Could you imagine being in the other boat without Jesus, freaking out? Somebody needs Jesus in their boat. Amen, somebody? That's just a little side note. It says, verse uh, 38, Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples, they woke up and they were shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? We're about to die up in here. Help a brother out. We're freaking out. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked, not the disciples, but he rebuked the wind, and he said, Waves, silence. Be still. Some of y'all need to learn how to be aggressive in your prayer life. When the waves are coming and they're rocking your boat, when the winds are coming and they're harassing you, when the waves of opposition come to just torment you and to steal your peace and to steal your joy, you've got to learn how to raise up your finger like this. And you've got you to point at that wave and say, shut up. My mama used to tell me, don't say shut up. That's not nice. But to the devil, you can tell him, shut up. Be silent. Be still. I'm just getting a little excited to be in the house of the Lord. So he says, silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped, and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no what? He says, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The opposite of faith is not unbelief. The opposite of faith is fear. Why are you still afraid? You have no faith. In the Matthew account, it says, oh, you of little faith. Man, your faith has just shrunk. What happened to your faith? In the Luke account, it says, where is your faith? So Jesus is challenging his disciples. Now, as a backdrop to this, Jesus had been talking and teaching about faith all the way up until this point. They were kind of uh, in class, so to speak. And Jesus was talking about the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about all these different things and the mustard seed and the kingdom of God is like the seed. And he's talking about faith and talking about the kingdom of heaven. But it goes from theory into practice now. They had heard about faith. But they hadn't grown in their faith. They had heard about a certain kind of faith, like of a mustard seed. But they themselves hadn't had their faith muscle developed yet. And we're going to explore this topic. And this last verse right here, verse 41, it says, The disciples, they were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked. Even the wind and the waves have to obey him. Dang. Now, this dude can not only feed people, but even the ocean, even the sea. Man, the waves, they just, whoosh. he's got authority over all of that. Jesus, Jesus is not only the one who talks about faith, he teaches about faith and he leads us in all faith. I'm going to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to help us explore this topic together. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your goodness. Thank you, God, that you're for us. And Lord, if you are for us, who can be against us? And God, I thank you for this time today that we have in your word. God, I pray that you would help me to communicate those things that you placed in my heart and my spirit for this time. Lord, we, we recognize that people need an encouragement today. Some people need breakthrough today. Some people need to be set free today. But, God, I thank you that he who the Son sets free is free indeed. It's not just theory, but it's reality. Father, we thank you for the evidence of transformed lives. I pray that, Holy Spirit, that you would come and that you would do the things that only you can do. We give you thanks in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said amen, amen and amen. Now, you might have to excuse me for just a little bit today because I'm a little sore. Just a little sore. I don't know if I've shared this with you, but we have one of our live groups is a running group, and Brittany is our coach. And Brittany, what's up? Right over there. That's my coach. And on Saturdays, my wife and I and a handful of us, we go, and we go and we run around or walk around Lake Merced here in San Francisco. And she helps us get, like, stretched, and it's early in the morning. She gets brace on, and we stretch our muscles, and we stretch. And she says, touch your toes. I'm like, do the knees count? You know, like, ah. Uh. <laughs> and so. So we do our little warm-ups, and then it's time to go running around that lake, and we get our worship on, hey, and we start running. And I remember the first time I started running, it's like, are we halfway there yet? And Oscar says, no, Pastor, we're like not even to the light yet, and uh, we got another four and a half miles to go. No. And I'm like, my goodness. And I hadn't run that course before, so I'm like, I don't even know, like, I don't even know how to measure the distance. 
Like, are we even halfway there? And I'm trying to pace myself, and people are trying to fellowship with me, and I don't do good when I try to run and fellowship. It just doesn't work for me. So how was your week? <laughs> good. <laughs> how was yours? <laughs> like, Pastor, we started like a minute ago. <laughs> True story. <laughs> my crank up my worship. I can't keep up with the talk. I can't multitask. I can't chew gum and run. And so I'm like, so I kept coming back, and every week it's my goal to go a little further. And I, I, I've managed to get to, like, I can run around half, half around, halfway around the lake. And like, all right. And then I do some walking, then I run a little bit more. And what I've learned is that my muscles, they need to be developed again. They need to be conditioned. And the biggest muscle that needs to be conditioned is this one right up here. Because physically, my body's catching up, but my mind is working against me like, you're so fat. You're so heavy. You shouldn't have had that cheesecake last night. Why would you get that extra scoop of ice cream last night? You're so dumb. And my mind is working against me. Like, not just me. That's the way my mind talks to me. Who do you think you are? When you were 22, you could run. But now you're 44, you're old and you're fat. And you're, you're going to die. If you were to die, what's going to happen to you? Just bear with me here. So. So every week we, 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 we continue to push the envelope a little bit. And we, we push the, the boundaries. And every week I'm like, I've got, I've got to go a little bit further. And then I was out of town last week, and I didn't do any, any running. I did a lot of eating, and I put some weight back on. So I went to run yesterday. Oh, my goodness, the devil's a liar. Every leg is super heavy. And I'm just battling. I'm not, I'm not going to be a team player right now. Y'all run at your pace if I slow down die. So I'm not going to keep on running. Don't even talk to me. I got to get to at least the halfway mark. Oscar was gracious. Come on, Pastor. You're doing all right. This is what I learned. If my muscles aren't being resisted, they're not going to grow. And if I take breaks from developing these muscles, I actually go backwards in my development. In order for me to continue to advance, I got to be consistent. I got to position myself to it ain't fun. It doesn't feel good. But the more I position myself, the more I allow my muscles to be resisted that way, the smarter I think, the better I eat, the people I surround myself with, the more li- there's going to be a greater likelihood that I'm going to continue to advance. And my goal is within the next month, I'm going to run around that entire leg without taking a break. Come on, somebody. Pray for your pastor. <laughs> but we're talking about today faith. And faith is like a muscle. There's different types of faith. The Bible talks about faith, and the Bible says that God's given all of us a measure of faith. You were created in the image of God, and there's a faith element inside of you. So faith is there. Faith is real. Then there's the gift of faith. God gives us the gift of faith. That's different. You can go to certain places, all of a sudden God will give you uh, the gift of faith, a specific purpose, and all of a sudden you step out like, well, where did that come from? I don't know, but something just kicked in. The gift of faith is activated. Sometimes the spirit of faith works through us, and it's a powerful thing. And then the Bible even refers to your religious convictions as being your faith. I'm talking today about the aspect of the measure of faith that we all have. And in that case, we all have to grow up in that, and we have to develop it. Faith has to grow. Jesus, from time to time, he would talk to to the disciples, and he would commend them for their faith, but at times he would rebuke them, saying, what happened to your faith? Oh, you of little faith, what happened to their faith? So we're going to explore that that topic. And then I'm also going to talk about the storms of life, particularly the ones that God sends our way. As I research uh, scripture, there are three primary types of storms that we all face. If you're Cleveland Cavalier, you're facing a certain kind of storm this week. It's just a storm of discouragement. Like, man, where did that come from? Those of you in uh, in the media booth, I love you. Even the Cavs fans that are serving in the media booth, love you. God's got you. There's different types of storms, the three different storms. There are storms that we bring upon ourselves. Sometimes it's like, you know what, I really want to have that car or I really want to be involved in this hobby. And we overextend ourselves and we, we, our budget is spread too thin. And pretty soon you're having to work extra long hours to try to afford so that you can pay the payments to this car or this thing that you're wanting to pursue. And you find yourself just being tired and fatigued. And it's like, man, life is just tough. No, it's tough because you made some poor choices. It probably wasn't the wisest choice right now. So you have these storms that are coming against you, and it's not that the devil's trying to resist you. Maybe you just didn't use the greatest judgment right then. So there's, there are storms that we can bring upon ourselves. There are storms that the devil actually brings our way. 
The Bible says that the, that the devil, the enemy, he is an opposer. He is the accuser of the brethren. He is an opposer. He wants to resist the plans of God from being fulfilled in your life. So he's going to try to resist you. He's going to try to try, try to hinder. And sometimes he'll bring waves of, of discouragement, of depression and, and anxiety and all these different things. And those are waves that, that come from the pit of hell. But then this is a tricky one. There are, there are storms that God actually sends our way. My God, I thought you loved me. Dang, bro, the preacher said that you love me so much that you got a picture of me on your refrigerator and life is hell right now. God, how could you send such a storm? I thought you loved me. I thought I was your boy. And sometimes, sometimes God will send a storm and there is, there is a purpose for that storm. The storms that God sends to you and me, they're not meant for our destruction. The storms that God sends our way are benefits for our edification. It's to build us up. It's to mature us. It's to grow us. It's to grow our faith so that we will be stronger. Not stronger in our own strength, but stronger in our dependency upon Him. So we're going to explore this topic. And i got some sound issues going on, so if you guys can help me with some of the reverb and stuff here. Um, let's explore here. Oh, geez, that's a storm coming my way. These are the storms that uh, we're going to explore, but we're going to explore this particular storm from Mark chapter 4. Jesus, um, Jesus, he actually is doing a mentoring moment with the disciples. They just didn't know that they signed up for it. They didn't know that that day earlier as they're ministering that Jesus said, oh, i got something good coming for you. <laughs> you got no idea. Peter, get ready. Disciples, get ready. Thomas, you're going to doubt everything along the way, but it's going to be so good. And, and Jesus has a plan. He's going to maximize the opportunity. I'm going to give you the four steps that Jesus used to help grow their faith. Are you with me so far? So let's explore these. In your notes, it would be this. Four steps that Jesus used to build his disciples' faith. Number one. Number one. Here's the first step. He brings them or he will bring you to the storm. It's a setup from God himself. God actually has a storm and it's got your name on it. I'm like, thanks, God. There's a storm coming to you. And you're like, wait, I hate storms. And it's going to rattle my world. But there's a storm tailor-made just for you. And maybe your roommate, if that storm hit him, it wouldn't affect him. But for you, oh, it's going to get you. Jesus actually, he brought them to this place. And some of the thoughts here, several of the disciples that were in this particular predicament, they were actually pros in boating. They were fishermen. They knew how to work the sea. For them to be overwhelmed, for them to be freaking out to the point where like, Master, wake up! We're about to die! For them to go crazy like that, it wasn't just a little patty cake kind of little storm. It was a severe storm. It was a significant storm to the point. Just imagine if they are the pros, imagine those that were like, like, the, like, like Matthew, the tax collector. He'd be freaking out. Oh my gosh! The, even the experienced disciples, they were freaking out. Jesus set them up perfectly. But uh, what was happening in this particular case was way beyond their own personal experience. It was way beyond their strength, their abilities, their talents. Notice how the Lord knows the level of maturity that we have and also our abilities. He knows how to push the right buttons to get to our attention. Again, like to someone else, maybe that storm won't phase them. But for you, God knows how to find you. That storm it has your name and he knows when to deliver it right at the exact perfect time. For you, it's the worst possible time, but for him, it's kind of like, this is going to be good. I got you, and I love you. God sends different storms to different people, and a true storm, it brings you to the end of yourself. A true storm sent from God will actually bring you to the edge of yourself. You're like, man, I think I'm going to die. God says, that's great. It's a great place to be because now I'm going to teach you how to trust me. You can't claw your way out of this. You can't climb your way out of this. You can't bribe your way out of this. You can't pay your way out of this. You can't butter it up. You're going to have to depend on me for this one right here. And when he brings you to the end of you, now you're ready to grow. Now you're ready to grow. So that's step number one. Step number two is that Jesus allows the storm to actually test your faith. So he doesn't just put you in a little cocoon and say, okay, hold your breath. Here comes the storm. It's going to be all right. It actually will rock you. It'll actually feel like, oh, my gosh, I am dying. How did this happen? I didn't, like, I didn't backslide. I didn't run away from God. But why is it that this is happening to me? Notice that Scripture says that it rains on the righteous and on the wicked. 
It rains on both the good folks and the folks that are doing evil. God allows these things to happen. He allows it. Why? Because he's trying to do something in our lives. Try to do something in your life. I love this quote from Pastor Mike Mazalongo. That's a cool name right there. Here's the quote that he, he writes. He says, we all go through various trials and tribulations in life that test our love, our strength, our goodness, and our patience. But in the Lord's faith, uh, faith building program, he allows something to come into your life that will bully its way through all of these things and strike at the very core of your spiritual being, which is your faith. The point of the test is not, uh, 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 not how, how kind or how patient you are, but if you believe in God for real. The point of the test isn't to see if you're a nice person, if you've got good morals, but will you trust God? That's the reason why God sends those storms. Now, the storm is not meant for your destruction. It's actually meant to grow you up and to build you up. We hate it when we go through, but when we get to the other side, whew, I feel so much better. But in the same way that I'm walking right now, I feel so much better that I was done with that assignment yesterday. I'm still sore. I'm still a little sore. As you go through your storms, God will get, to, get you to the other side and he will grow you. But it doesn't mean that the pain will depart immediately either. Some of you got, oh, come on, somebody. Some of you need to get this in your spirit. Some of you guys, you've experienced the breakthrough of the Holy Spirit. But then you wonder why you're still sore. Why? Because the, the battle was real. The struggle was real. Pain was real. And you're trying to figure out, why is it that I still struggle? Perhaps you're just being healed up. God's already sent breakthrough your way. You've been growing. You've been maturing in the things of God. Pain doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing. Maybe it's just a reminder that you're dependent upon God. When you're going through a difficult time, when you're experiencing some pain, maybe it causes you to get back on your knees again. Maybe it provokes you to say, you know what? I couldn't do this without God. I'm reminded right now I need him. I need him to be my breakthrough. I need him to be my strength. Don't you ever become so comfortable. Don't you ever become so self-serving where you're like, you know what? I got this, God. No, you don't. No, you don't. We are fully dependent beings upon God. We need Him. Every breath we take is because of Him. Our strength doesn't come from us. It comes from Him. And as we grow in God, it may not feel good, but God's got this. And I'm okay with being reminded of my dependency upon Him. I don't want to build anything out of my own strength. My family, my home, my marriage, our church. We want to, we want to be in agreement with the Holy Spirit. We want to be a part of what He's building. Am I, am I preaching to somebody here today? The pain is good. The pain is a reminder. The pain is a reminder that God is at work in our lives, believing that he is the author and the finisher of our faith. And he who began a good work, he's faithful to complete it. So don't jump off that treadmill of faith. Don't jump off of the processes and the seasons of God. Allow him to do what he needs to do in your life. And even if it hurts, still good, still good. Step number two. So faith in God is the ultimate test. Because the Bible says a few things. It says, first thought, that God is the one who is over creation, according to Job 42, verse 2. He's over everything. Another thought, God is the one who is over the affairs of all the nations, not just Christians. God is actually in control everywhere, according to Job 12, 23. God is the one who is over man's birth and lot in life. We find that in Job 14, verse 5. God is the one who is over success and failure in life. God is over all of that, according to Luke 1, 52. God is the one who is over every single event, whether good or bad. He's still over all of that. He's still got this. We find that in Matthew 10, 30. So here's, here's the big idea for this morning's message. Here's the big thought that I love for you to just kind of get into your spirit. Here's the big idea. When it comes to this faith that is growing in us, the Lord's quote-unquote workout program is designed to test your faith. You may become depressed, angry, discouraged, afraid, tired, dazed, or confused. But in the end, despite everything that you felt and thought and experienced, the question will be, do you still believe? Do you still believe? Somebody, some, some folks, they love God, come to the house of God, they serve the Lord, and when everything is going good, they love Jesus with all their hearts. But when the storms start coming... Whose name do you continue to call on? And by the way, if you want to know whether Jesus truly is Lord, like when the rubber really meets the road, wait for the tough times to, to come. That's when you're going to know who's really in control in your life. 
Because when things are going easy, Jesus, you're in control. Jesus at the center of it all. We sing songs, Jesus this, and you're like, but when tough times come, who do you call upon? Do you, do you run to him or from him? Are you a Jonah? Come on, somebody. Do you run away from the purposes of God or do you run towards him? The testing of your faith. James said it in James chapter 1. He says, consider it pure joy when you face or experience tests or trials of many kinds. Why? Because those tests, they're going to do something on the inside of you. It's going to develop perseverance. And perseverance is going to grow, causing you to become complete, mature. The Bible says perfect, not lacking anything. So when test comes, it's for our benefit. It's not fun, but it's for our benefit. So that's the big idea right there. In God's workout program, the faith, where it's like, God, I want you to grow me. Do you really? All right. I'm going to add some weight. It's not going to be uh, super easy. It's not going to be like, the, like it used to be before. But if you will trust me, you're going to grow. At the end, will you trust him? Will you believe him or not? Here's the third step. The third step when Jesus was mentoring these disciples the third step is that he will leave you in your storm. What? I thought he said in the Bible that he will leave us or forsake us. He will leave you for just a little minute. He'll leave you. You will feel at times like, God, I thought, I know intellectually that you got this, but right now, I don't feel that you're around. I don't feel your presence through this moment right now. In my head, I know that you're God and PJG preached the other day that, God, you're over all these things. But right now, you might be over, but you're not near. What's going on? Do you not think that Jesus, when he was in that boat, the waves were kicking like that? Do you, do you think that he was not aware, perhaps, even in his deep sleep? Even if he was snoring. It was so severe for them to be aggravated the way that they were. I'm pretty convinced that he was aware. And he could have silenced those storms earlier, but he didn't. Had Jesus actually silenced those waves right at the beginning, they would have missed out on the opportunity to grow. It would have been a wasted test. It would have been a wasted blessing. Somebody got asking to abort, 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 abort. God, mayday, mayday, pull me out of this hellhole right now, God. And God says, not yet. I sent this storm to you because I love you. And if he were to pull you out of that place right now, you would have to go through this again at some point down the road. You might as well just buckle in, fasten your seatbelts, take a deep breath and saying, all right, God, I don't get it. I don't understand it. I hate it. But as long as you're my boat with me, I'm going to trust you. Jesus could have hushed the waves earlier, but he allowed him to go through that process. Why? Faith muscle was being developed. Come on, somebody. Are you getting this in your spirit today? Don't fight it. Embrace it. Don't fight the storm. Now, listen, if it's a storm that you brought upon yourself, talk to Pastor Marquise. He will coach you out of it. Pastor David and the team will help you. And if it's the devil, man, you come to the pursue prayer nights and we'll do warfare with you against those things. But if it's a storm that came from God, embrace it. Say, God, I trust you. I believe your word. God, I believe that you're not done with me yet. You're not done with my family yet. So he leaves, he leaves us sometimes in the storm, but it's not a permanent thing. He allows us to experience that because why? He wants our heart to be positioned in that place of God. That's good. That's, that's where he wants you. Right there. Jesus, he could have stopped the storm immediately, but he didn't. People oftentimes, when, they, uh, when they're caught up in these storms, they usually cry out, why me, God? Why this? Why now? <laughs> God, I'm, I'm doing your work. I'm trying to help people. Maybe you're, you're a stay-at-home mom and you got some kids like, God, we couldn't afford this test right now. You know how stressful life is right now. Why this and why now? Why us? I thought we were people in covenant with you, God. What's going on? God's got a blessing in that test. Another way that people would respond is, God, how long or how long or, or how much or how are we going to survive through all of this? Maybe those are some questions that you're asking yourself right now in this season. Or another question, God, how much longer? Well, PJ, did you keep on preaching this morning? Don't worry, I'm almost done. A couple of minutes and we'll be done. Here's a thought. The real issue is not the storm itself but it's the condition of your faith. That's the issue. 
The issue isn't the storm. What's the condition of your faith? You want to grow in the things of God? Storms are going to come. That's just a tool. That's just the instrument that God is using. He's building you because he loves you. The eye of the storm is where the weak faith is strengthened and true faith is revealed. When you're right at the core of this, that's when, that's when, you're, that's when you're exposed. And whatever's on the inside gets revealed. And God says, all right, let's work with that. If your faith doesn't grow in the storm, then whatever happened, it happened for absolutely nothing. But through this storm, if your faith grows, then that blessing will continue to, to multiply and grow. And you'll find yourself growing more and more in, your, in the recognition of who God is and how you need him. These tests are good. These storms are good. Another thought, Jesus, he leaves you in the storm so that your faith will build endurance, hope, and unshakable trust in him. Can I just be honest with you? As opposed to not, I guess. Of course I'm going to be honest with you. Your hope is placed on people or spiritual leaders. I'm I'm just going to tell you, just brutally honest, you're going to disappoint yourself real soon. If it hasn't happened yet, you're going to find that even people with great intentions, they'll drop the ball, including yours truly. Pastors and leaders, it's just we're, we're all the same. We all need the Holy Spirit to work inside of us. And hopefully we're growing and we're maturing. But you can't put all of your trust and hope in man. you got to put your hope and trust in God and in God only. Now, Paul, Paul said it like this. He said, Paul, Paul said, he goes, he says, hey, follow me or my as I follow Christ. So as I'm pursuing Christ, he says, follow me. And, and the same would be true with our leaders. Follow us as we're pursuing Christ. But your hope, you can't be invested in people. People will let you down. People won't have all the answers. Even though the Holy Spirit indwells us, I'm not going to be able to give you all the answers that that you need for the questions that you have in your heart or mind right now. But God does. And the same Holy Spirit that's inside of me, He's inside of you. What we're being reminded of right here is we don't call to people. We always call to God. God will use the company of believers. He will use the local church. He will use His family to help us grow. But ultimately, you have to have direct access to God Himself. And that's what That's what's amazing about what Jesus did. In the Old Testament, people would worship God by having to go through a priest. And the priest would then offer sacrifices to God, and he was a mediator. But Jesus came, he rent the veil, he tore that veil that would separate us from God. And now we have direct access to God. It's amazing. It's amazing. Learn how to cry out to God. One of my favorite verses, how many of you here went through our EDGE program way back in the day? Hey, hey, hands going up all throughout. You guys will be familiar with this verse. It's found in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. In the NLT, it says the temptations. In the Greek word, that word temptations in the Greek is the word test. So the tests, the tests in your life, they're not different from, from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation or tests to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted or tested, he will show you a way out so that you can endure God is faithful. He won't test you beyond what you can bear, but he's going to provide a way for you to stand up under these pressures so that you'll endure and that you will thrive through it all. So God will bring you to the end of you, but he won't kill you, but it'll be real close. (laughs) Collectively, it was last fall when we got our notice. We have 90 days to move. I'm like, all right, team, let's pray. I know we have to do this in the spirit first, so let's pray. And our prayer meetings were pretty good. Decibel level, probably about 85. La, 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 Tongues, yes. La, 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 intense, yes. Bring Hav in the prayer meeting. It's like it's fuego, you know, like, ha, ah, we're going. We're praying. That's what 90 days. 60 days, and we have to move. Our prayer level, it's intensifying. We're researching. We're doing our part in our prayers. It's like we're not panicking yet, but we're praying a little more fervently, hitting the 90 decibel range. 30 days, we're praying very fervently. And it's trippy because it's like God already had all this in his hand. But he wanted, I think, to provoke us to press in a little bit more. If you remember last fall, all of a sudden, the same way that I called for prayer meetings for this week, I was hitting hitting you up at church saying, guys, um, I think it would be really cool. Help! I think it would be really amazing. Help! That we come and pray together, stay cool. 
We got to pray. We got to seek the Lord. We got to press through in the spirit. And we called some prayer meetings together and y'all showed up and we started praying fervently. The decibel level started peaking and hitting 100. And we're praying fervently. I'm praying desperately. I'm praying all throughout the day, every meal, every prayer that I had. It goes back. We need a building, God. FYI, just a little reminder for one, the building. And people are saying, I got ram in the thicket. The prophet would say, God's already got this. That's cool, but where the heck is the thicket? Where's the building? At least give me like a general idea. Where should we be looking at? And we looked at every building on the market, and we looked at there was just no darn building. And with two weeks to go, my wife takes the team to, with, with Peter and Chinga to Thailand, and my daughters go, and I have to hold up the fort. With two weeks to go, we still had no building. I was praying and fasting. I was seeking God desperately. I was crying like a little child. God! And God says, I got this. I just want you to keep praying a little bit longer. <laughs> Suffer a little bit longer. Experience this moment and learn what it is to trust me. Praise God for the prophetic words. Praise God for all the encouragement. But even the prophets couldn't replace our prayers. It still required all of us praying. And I had to pray. And I had to press through. And I had to experience my own breakthrough. And in my spirit, I was strong. But my emotions, I told Pastor Keys, dude, I'm tired. I'm just so tired right now. And our team, we had to just press through. It's for our good. It's for our benefits. The testing of our faith, just it produces results in our lives. God, sometimes it feels like he leaves us in our storm, but he hasn't abandoned us. And the last thought here, the last step, number four, Jesus, he leads you to the calm waters. Jesus, he'll bring you through the storms and then he'll, he'll silence things. You're like, when we got this building, it's like, is this a sick joke? Is this for real? God, you did this. Amazing. Like, what's the catch? There is no catch. God's blessed us and it felt so good, but it's also a reminder. Lord, we need you. And he says, I got this. I just needed you to trust me. None of, none of what we do at City Life is because we're smart or, or, or bright or brilliant or gifted. It's because God's been gracious to us. Exercising faith, it starts with asking God for help first. That's how it starts. If you want to grow in your faith, you got to ask God. Don't go horizontal, go vertical. The last verse for this, this morning, Hebrews eleven six, 6. And it is impossible to please God with, without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him, they must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. As I wrap this time up, five thoughts in conclusion. Here's one. God wants your faith to grow. Number two, God allows storms to find you. Number three, there's a blessing in every storm. Number four, trusting God through the storm is what will grow you. And then number five, God rewards your obedience and your trust. Would you stand to your feet? Allow me to pray for you this afternoon. The Bible says, put on the full armor of God. All these different areas in our lives need to be covered. When it comes to our faith, praise God for the shield of faith. God comes to help protect our faith, but we still have to have our faith grow. Like a muscle, it needs to be developed. Maybe you find yourself in a season where you're like, man, I'm feeling kind of strong and encouraged in my faith right now. Good. Don't relax too much. Don't coast. Lean in. If you're experiencing a moment of strength in your faith, Allow your faith maybe to spill over onto somebody else. Pray and intercede for others that are weak in their faith right now. Allow the Holy Spirit to stretch you. It's okay to have your, your faith stretched even on behalf of others. Pray for our city. Pray for the mayor. Pray for the politics. Pray for what's going on in our city right now. Pray for our, our, our state and our nation. Exercise your faith. Pray for people that need a breakthrough. Align your faith with theirs and just allow the Holy Spirit to stretch you, intercede and press through. When you're only praying for your own storm, missing out on the opportunity to be blessed, but also to be a blessing to somebody else. Allow your faith to be partnered with others. Or perhaps you're here today and you're like, man, my faith is weak. I'm like those disciples. I believe Jesus. I believe his word, but I'm just tired right now. I feel like my faith is weak. I need God to help me through my storm. I need to recognize it. First key, just call upon him. Call upon the name of Jesus. That's the key. That's the number one uh, response that we should have. And watch what the Lord will do. He'll get you through it. Can I pray for us? Would you do something just crazy with me? Just raise your hands to heaven. It's not like the, the officer that says freeze and you throw your hand. No, I'm talking about a surrender. In Hebrew culture, whenever you would recognize 
uh, uh, dignitaries and kings, you'd raise your hand and salute or say, Lord, we surrender to you. Father, today you see our hands, you see our hearts, you see our faith, you see the condition of our faith. And Lord, we recognize that we need you, God. In the good days and in the tough days, we need you. We can't do this thing without you. We can't do it without your grace. But God, we make ourselves available. We recognize that you are God and we're not. You are king. You're the one that's in control. We honor you today. God, we say that we're fully submitted and surrendered to you. Father, we say have your way in our lives. Be exalted in our lives. God, and we do throw our hands up saying we surrender to you. Help us, God. For those that are going through hellacious storms right now, God, I pray that you would give them strength and courage, that you would cause us to trust you, God, that we would not put our confidence in man or a system, but we would put our confidence in you. Holy Spirit, we trust you even today. Let there be an impartation of faith into every heart now. Strengthen our faith. Build up our faith. Develop our faith. Heal our faith. Deliver us in faith. God, work through us. Let faith grow in our lives. Jesus, be exalted in and through us. In your mighty name. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. As we close out every service here at City Life, we kind of did a sucky golf club. Do you want to clap? Let's clap to Jesus. Now, hey. Every service, we always close out with a prayer of helping people get right with God. Maybe you came today and you've been distant from God. You and God, you haven't been cool. One of two scenarios has played out in your life, perhaps. Number one, maybe you've never given him the opportunity to be the designated driver in your life. Real talk. You heard about church. You heard about Christians. You heard about God. But you personally never chose to say, God, I want to open my heart and allow you to come into my life. I want to make that exchange with you. I want to give you my messed up life, and I want to receive your life. Maybe that's your prayer today. Or perhaps the second scenario. Maybe at some point in your journey you did, but life happened. You got distracted. Things happened. And you find yourself distant from God where he's not the one calling the shots. Maybe you are or others are. But you say, you know what? I need to get right with God. I need to rededicate my life to him today. Either way, if, if the first scenario or the second scenario is your story, I believe that as we pray, God is going to hear your prayer right where you're at. He's going to hear your prayer. and He's going to answer it. And he's going to help you get jump-started in this faith journey with him. There's hope for all of us. Shall we pray together? Would you repeat after me? Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for coming after me. Today I open my heart. I invite you into my life. Be the Lord of my life. I repent of all my sins, of all my selfish ways. I surrender to you fully. Be Lord over all. Help me, Jesus, to live a life of purpose and that will make a difference in other people's lives. In your name, and everybody said, amen. Come on, let's tell all of our friends who prayed. Congratulations. Amazing. Amazing, amazing. If you said that prayer today, either for the first time or maybe it was a prayer of rededication, uh, Carla's hanging out at the Fresh Start booth. We have a little gift for you. It's a Jump Start kit. It's got some goodies in there that will help you get you going on your journey of faith with Jesus. God's got you. He wants to help you. So be sure to swing by and say hello to Carla. She'll give you that little packet to get you going. Also, maybe you've been coming to City Life for the last few weeks or a few months. And if you'd like to learn a little bit more about who we are, meet some of our crew. We have something called Next Steps. It's going to start in about five minutes. Right to my left, to your right. We'd love to invite you to come. It's our little VIP room. Come and say hello to some of us pastors and leaders. Hear our story. We'd love to share it with you. For the rest of us, have a wonderful week. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week. Amen.